Hello and welcome. This is Heavy Business. I'm Aaliyah. And I'm Corey. And today we have on the mighty tank, the tech, um, YouTuber, Hi. Twitch extraordinaire, and <laughs> guitar tech, and tour manager. Actually, instead, instead of me trying to list all your titles, why don't you give us a brief explanation of who you are and what you do okay. in the music industry? I mean, you got a lot of, I would say nowadays tour manager is more accurate than guitar tech. It's been a while, but, uh, uh, yeah, my name's tank. I, um, have been touring in the music industry for pretty much my entire adult life, like almost 17 years now. Uh, I've done a lot of different jobs. Um, right now I'm currently been a tour manager for a while, but I've also been a guitar tech, a drum tech, a merchandise manager, a pyrotechnician. I mean, a lot of different things. And over the pandemic, I started a YouTube channel and a Twitch stream, and that's kind of turned into a thing. So when I'm not touring, that's what I do. And a how did you get, uh, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Aaliyah. I was like, pyrotech? Yeah. Yes. I, I'm try, my, the, the, the arsonist in me is like trying to avoid that one because I'll talk about fire for 10 years. <laughs> it was, that was kind of a wild one because uh, the band that I was working for at the time was doing it uh they were support on an arena tour and they wanted to do pyro but they didn't really have the budget to bring somebody else out to do it so they actually paid for my training to get certified as a pyrotechnician so that i could tech and also be in charge of the pyro so i was doing both things on the one tour oh well that's awesome yeah it's fun it's just getting to like Press the button that makes the fire go everywhere every day. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> How involved is that certification? If it's just, I mean, I assume it's involved somewhat. No, believe not. it. It was done in a day. It, it was, it is mind blowing to me how quick you can actually get a certification to do like pyro. There are a lot of legal things where um, you have to get certified state by state. So I got certified in Tennessee where I got trained. So that means anywhere in Tennessee, I can operate pyro, uh, specifically flames is what I got certified for. And I could operate that at any venue in Tennessee. But if you're on tour, the, the kind of catch, but also loophole is that you have to have a local pyrotechnician from that state that you're in there with you as well. And you can basically, because they're there and present, uh, like piggyback off of their certification in that state. So even though I was still doing the pyro in different states, we had to have a local pyrotechnician there to oversee everything too. So the certification is easy, but if you're going on tour, there are some other things that need to be lined up before you can actually like do it. Interesting. And um, okay, just say ahead. hypothetically, you got certified in all 50 states. Would you still need the local guy or could you go rogue? No. Now you oh. just do, you just, you're the one on tour and you just do it. Nice. Yeah. But that's, that's a lot of, uh, I think <laughs> the, the biggest thing with that is that's a lot of money. Like mm -hmm. that's a, that's a lot of money for the certification. That's why a lot of pyrotechnicians will get certified. And then when they tour, they'll just have the local people come by. They'll kick them a little bit of money just to be there for the day. And then, but then you have to go through the fire marshal stuff every single day too. Like you can't just set up and go. Like you actually have to do a big demo for the fire marshals in that town every day. And they they basically get to tell you whether they're comfortable with you using the pyro at the show or they're not. But it's very rare that they shut something down. All, all the times I've done pyro, I've only had one fire marshal ever that was like, I'm just, I think he was new and he had never seen the flame units we were using. And he was just like, I'm not comfortable signing off on this. And I was like, all right, fair enough. So we just didn't do pyro that day. Oh. Yeah. And backing it up just a tiny little bit. How did you get started tour managing in, in general? Because I mean, you've done, like you said, a lot of things in the industry. How did it kind of build towards tour managing? Um, it, it, It's something I always wanted to do. But the full-time role of it actually happened recently in kind of funny circumstances. But I've been an assistant tour manager on quite a few tours over the years, like within the past 10 years. And um, I always knew that I wanted to be more in like a production or tour management role. Like I enjoy doing logistics and planning and all the little things that goes into that. And what, what really turned this into a big full-time thing was 
when Electric Callboy was supposed to come over to the States uh, in late 2022, uh, that first tour that ended up getting canceled, uh, they originally asked me to guitar tech. And then when I got the itinerary from management and the list of all the crew that was coming over, they had a guitar tech listed on the crew manifest. So I called him and I was like, so you're bringing your guitar tech. Does this mean you're wa expecting me to tour manage the whole thing? And he goes, yeah, I figured that would just be easy for everybody. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> it kind of just from being like, and I was okay with it. Like they didn't even really ask beforehand. They just said, yeah, we just assumed with your background, you could do it. And um, I gladly said yes. Um, and then it has now turned into I'm with them full time. I actually leave for Germany in 10 days to do their European tour. Nice. So, yeah, it's pretty wild, actually. <laughs> well, there's not many bands more delightful to tour with than those guys. They're they're the best. And I, I don't say that because I'm working for them right now. Like I've toured with a lot of people. I wasn't even planning on touring full time anymore after my daughter was born. And after I did the U.S. tour with them, it, it was just the the connection with them, like working for them and the friendship and the way they treat their crew. And I, I've done so many tours where there's always one person on a crew in, in, on every tour that everyone can't stand. It's just it's kind of statistics. It's like if you get like 20 people in a room, there's, of course, going to be one person that's just like, you know, when they walk in the room, everybody's like, ugh. With these guys, there isn't that at all. And they treat every single member of their crew like they're a member of the actual band. So it was such a wonderful, lovely experience that when they asked me if I would be interested in doing it full time, I had a long conversation with my wife about it. And she's like, you know what? I think if it was any other band, like out of the blue, she goes, I don't think I would be okay with you being gone as much. But because it's them and they were just like, you're happy and they treated you so good. And she's just like, I'm fine with it. And they're such family people too. Like some of them have kids that like they, when I would be FaceTiming with my daughter from the road, like Kevin and Nico would like jump in behind me and talk to my daughter and stuff. And she like loves their band. So it was just such a good experience that it's, it's really kind of magical the way that it worked out. And I'm like super excited about it. Yeah, I think there is this kind of perception amongst a lot of people that you can't really make it having a family work with having a career in the music industry and you just have to find the right balance, it sounds like. Find yeah, right it, people. Is, it is difficult. I mean, even when I was younger and like single and didn't have a kid yet or anything like that, like I toured with bands who had uh, kids and they were married and stuff like that. And when when you're not married and you don't have a kid and stuff like that, you kind of don't fully understand it yet. Like you can see that it's kind of difficult for people, but until you're in that position, like you really realize like it, it is it's you miss your loved ones. You miss being home with your family. Um, the good thing about this electric callboy situation is that they they have been so accommodating that like every time we have a lengthy amount of time off, they're, they, they're just flying me home so I can spend time here. Like I don't have to stay in Europe all the time which is wild. Not a lot of bands would do that, but it is difficult. It is very difficult. I've seen bands and touring techs that have pretty much put a halt on their career because of how much it affected their personal life. But I think a big part of that is uh, whoever you're with, like them understanding too. Um, when I was kind of getting serious with my now wife, uh, this was like 2013. Um, at the time I was working for uh, Pat Benatar. And I remember having a conversation with her and her husband uh, about being serious with with Claire, my wife. And they were like, has she ever been on the road? Does she actually know what you do? Like, does she she get it? And I was like, I mean, she she knows from what I've told her, but they're like, bring her out. So like she came out with us to see like what our days looked like and how everything operated. And she's like, wow, this is I mean, she, it's it's its job. Like, I think the stereotype is that everybody's just raging and partying. And don't get me wrong, there are situations where there have been tours that are like that. But um, no, it's very much a job. And if you, you're with somebody that understands that, it makes it a lot easier. 
So since we're talking about perceptions of the job, could you give us like the nitty gritty explanation of what it is that a tour manager does? So it's kind of the way I explain like guitar teching to people is that I take care of all of the gear and instruments so that the only thing that the artist has to do is worry about walking on stage and playing. It's kind of the same thing as a tour manager. I take care of all of the logistical details of the entire tour so that the crew can just walk into a venue and know exactly what's going on, what they're walking into, uh, how the day is going to go schedule wise and stuff like that. So um, pre tour, there's a lot that goes into it. I actually think when you're on tour, it becomes easier. Um, so right now, uh, before tours start, I have to reach out to bus companies, truck companies, vendors for gear, stuff like that. I have to get quotes from different bus companies to find out which one is going to give us a good price, which one is going to make the most sense for us to use. Same with trucks. Um, once we know what we want to bring out for lighting and audio and stuff like that, I have to reach out to a bunch of different companies to get quotes on all that stuff. So there's a lot of planning on that end. But once we have all that information, I also have to advance every single show. And that is me either calling or emailing often both. Uh, I like to have a paper trail of everything, but I also like to speak on the phone to venues and we go over everything. I tell them what we're bringing what we require for power to power all of that stuff, uh, what we're traveling in so they can make parking arrangements, how many people are going to be with us. We go over hospitality riders for food, if there's any like dietary restrictions, uh, the schedule of the day, how many stagehands we need for everything. I mean, it's literally every little detail of a tour is, uh, is what a tour manager is taking care of. And then once we get on the road, usually all that information is concrete and ready to go. So we use an app called master tour that I, I actually love sitting here and just plugging in information. And with the desktop version of it, I can plug in every single piece of information that a crew or a band needs to know. And then they have an app on their phone that they can just pull up the day and be like, Oh, this is a 5,000 capacity venue. The stage is 40 feet wide by 30 feet deep. They have power for all of our stuff. There's four dressing rooms, like all of that information. Um, so yeah, it's mostly, it's, it, it's mostly logistics and planning. And then the day of the show, there are other things too, like, uh, putting together guest lists, making sure that the band gets to media and gets to where they need to be. And you know, some of that stuff's challenging sometimes. I think it's, it's kind of funny. Like I, no matter how well you prep a guest list for a show, there's always something wrong. I don't know why. It's usually like a venue can't figure out where something is or um, when a person shows up that security's like, no, they can't come in. And I'm like, dude, this has already been prearranged. Like there's always something. So those are the things that you have to adjust to on the fly as well. And, you know, I'm the point person that during the day, if, if the crew needs anything or has a question or the band needs anything, like I'm the person that everybody goes to, to just make stuff happen. So you're, you're kind of the, the head of everything. You're trying to make everybody happy and make their lives as easy as possible. Yeah, for sure. And on that same note, there's kind of a lot of either misconceptions or misunderstandings with all of the things that end in the word manager. So band manager, production manager, and tour manager. Can you go into a little bit of the differences between all the different types of managers that people might meet on the road or need on the road? Yeah, for sure. Because there's, there's quite a few. Mm -hmm. um, so the band manager is the literally self-explanatory, the band's manager. That is the person that is managing their careers that is handling all the business stuff and stuff like that. Sometimes managers have a day-to-day -day manager, which is a person that will take care of scheduling for the band. It's kind of like an assistant to the band's manager. Uh, a tour manager is the person that oversees, like we talked about, everything on the whole tour, the logistics, the planning, the transportation. Uh, sometimes you might hear the term road manager instead of tour manager, but there is a slight difference. Uh, road manager usually refers to uh, a person working directly for the band where tour manager is in charge of the tour. So uh, like opening bands, usually it's like the, their tour manager would be referred to as a road manager because they're road managing that band, but they're not in charge of the tour. Um, 
production managers, you start seeing a lot of production managers on bigger tours. That is where uh, oftentimes the duties of the tour manager get split. So on larger arena tours, while the tour manager would take care of everything I talked about already, a production manager is their job is usually to also advance with the venue and speak about the specific production elements of the show. So on bigger tours, or sorry, on like smaller club tours, where I as a tour manager would be um, going over all the details of the venue, the power, the gear, all that. That's something a production manager would do on a bigger tour. So on those tours, a venue would be advancing with a tour manager and a production manager about two separate things, which sounds like it would be confusing, but it's really not. It actually works out very well. Um, and then the other thing you usually hear management wise on the road, you know, merchandise manager, obviously self-explanatory as well. Um, I actually prefer that term. I know some people usually just say merch guy, merch girl, you know, stuff like that. But um, merchandise managers, I think, uh, are very like underrated in the music industry. I think the general public thinks that like, oh, they just sell T-shirts and that's it. But there's a there's a lot of behind the scenes work that uh, merchandise managers do as well. After the show, they have to do accounting for everything that was, you know, done at a show that night with money and stuff like that. They have to make deposits. They have to send in settlement sheets. They have to do settlement sheets with the venue. The merchandise managers advance shows as well. Like they merchandise. I don't advance anything to do with merch as a tour manager. Our merchandise manager on the road would reach out to the venues themselves and go over everything related to the merchandise for that day. So I think manager is a very good word for them instead of just referring to them as a merch guy or merch girl or something like that. I think, I think uh, the growth in changing from sort of position to position, like from guitar tech to a tour manager to, you know, or from other positions to a tech might happen naturally, but how, and maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't, but how do you break into that production side of touring and live shows to begin with? So years and years ago, I was, I was in a band and I think this is how it starts for a lot of people. I, I can only speak for me, but I was in a band like a lot of other people and we did, we never got signed, but we did a lot of big tours. We, we always got put on as an opener on tours and super long story short, I reached a point with my band where I was just, we, we weren't making money. We we're broke. And when I say broke, I mean, there was like three years of my life where I didn't have like more than $20 in my bank account at all times. And we were just on tour in a van and trailer nonstop. And I got burned out of it. And one of the bands that we were touring with at the time on like a national tour I had gotten close with and I kind of told them like, hey, I, I I think after this one, man, like, I think I might just be done with my band. And I was talking to them about their struggles they've had and stuff. And they were like, well, you know, we don't want to tell you what to do. But if you ever do quit your band, uh, we, we'd hire you like because we we need a couple of crew spots. So they eventually did hire me when I quit my band. And my first job ever in the industry was as a merchandise manager. And I actually did that for years. Um, I, I did merchandise management for bands from the club level all the way up to like arenas and stadiums and stuff. And I think that job prepped me for tour management better than anything else I did on the road. But I've always been the kind of person that I just want to learn as much about everything as I can. So like I used to do lighting at uh, a, a club in Chicago when um, when I was younger, when I wasn't touring. And I mentioned to the band, like they didn't have a lighting director at the time. And I was like, hey, do you think like, you know, when you guys go on stage, close down the merch booth and I can do lighting for you guys? And they were like, yeah, sure. And we did that and it worked out. And then I kept telling them I wanted to get into teching. So then they their drummer at the time taught me like everything to know about drums and I became his drum tech. And then moving from gig to gig, it's just, I was the kind of person that like, I talked about this on another podcast recently, but the term fake it till you make it is like, there is a little bit of truth to that. There have been many times in my touring career where I've been asked if I could do something and I just say yes. And I figure it out. And that's kind of, um, What's happened a lot. Like somebody's like, hey, can you do this? 
Like we have a tour starting in like a month or two. Can you do this job? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. And at the time, the answer is probably no, I couldn't, but I spent the next month or two learning how to do it. So, and as a tour manager now, I'm very uh, fortunate and grateful for the fact that I have done all of these different jobs on the road, because that gives me a good insight to what everybody on a tour is doing. And it gives me a level of respect for what everybody is doing, because I've been on some tours with tour managers that have, have never done anything other than tour management. And there is at times this weird totem pole hierarchy of roles on tour where people are looked down on and stuff like people don't respect merchandise managers people don't respect you know people that aren't directly involved with the band like sound guys and lighting guys and techs and stuff like that you know one of my recent tours like we we had a um a merch girl out with us that was doing merchandise management and she first first time we talked i was just like hey i just want you to know i did merchandise for years so I, I get your job. And if there's anything you ever have a problem with or anybody gives you a hard time, you just let me know. And like we had, she's like, it's amazing having somebody that actually knows what I'm doing because half the time I'm just getting like shit on by everybody. And it's, it's unfortunate. It's kind of a bummer to hear that kind of stuff. Definitely. I think mutual respect for other people is, mm -hmm. is so critical. You never know what everyone else's, what other people's jobs entail, unless you, like you did, you actually did the job. Mm -hmm. So appreciate what everyone is doing. Yeah. Cause I mean, the show doesn't go on without everybody doing their job. Right? That's, that's the fact. I mean, a, a lot of people on tour would argue that their job's more important than another job on the tour or that. Oh, I see again, going back to the merchandise managers, like people like to dump on their job and be like, Oh, it's easy. I could sell a t-shirt. I was like, I give it a try for a tour. I think I, I've seen like old bitter sound guys are like merch is so easy. I'm like, give it a try for a tour and see how you like doing it. Cause it is you not only do you have to be very detail oriented, like with the accounting and the orders and stuff like that, you have to deal with the fans all night. You have to have a certain level of like social awareness and being able to communicate with people that that not everybody has that. That's why a good merchandise manager is super valuable to bands on the road. So we're talking about all of these jobs, all of these people, all of these parts that make a tour work. Um, a lot of bands just starting out, they don't have anybody on their team and they're just doing everything themselves. So what do you think are some signs that they should start considering adding people to their team, either a tour manager, merchandise manager, what have you? I think the first thing is when you start to realize that you can't do everything by yourself because they're, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the base there for a lot of bands. It's like when they get to a level where they just can't do everything by themselves anymore. Cause when you're a young band, every member of the band is usually doing something in terms of the operation as a whole. Like when we toured, it was just the five of us and we each had different things that we were good at and that we did. But um, when bands are starting to gain some traction and get bigger, they can't do everything. Like it's impossible to run sound for yourself when you're on stage. And I always think that the most important thing for the two most important things for a band to do is a uh, front of house engineer and merchandise manager. Cause front of house engineer, if you get a good one is going to make you sound consistent and good every day. And that is, that is what is going to get a lot of attention from people when you're trying to make a name as a band. Like you may have really good lighting in production, but if your sound isn't good, that's what people are going to talk about. So if you're an up and coming band and you, you're an opener on a tour or something and you have a sound guy that can make you sound awesome every night, that's going to bring in the fans and it's super valuable. And then having that merchandise manager that's able to take care of all of that stuff and that's able to man the table every night and just it's 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 a load of stress off of the band when they have somebody like that in that role. So I think. Those are the two most important things when people are considering on who to hire. Um, but like I said, it all boils down to um, like when you can't do everything yourself anymore or your band, your, you as a band member are getting so stressed and burned out of trying to do 10 different things. Um, and I say the same thing about management too. Um, there's a, there's a band um, that's blowing up pretty good right now that when they tour, they have a crew and stuff, but they're still self-managed. And I was talking to them recently and they were like, man, we've gotten offers, but we don't know if we should do anything. And I was like, well, 
can you still do it yourselves? Is it stressful? Is it, is it causing you stress? Is it taking time out of other things you could be doing? Cause if it's not, I'd say keep doing it yourself because then you can save that money too. But that's, that's the most important thing. When, when there's too much on your plate that everybody starts getting stressed and can't get everything done, that's when you need to think about hiring, but you also need to keep finances in mind too, because bringing people on the road is not cheap. Right. And you, you mentioned on another podcast I was listening to that some people think having a manager is like this place when you've arrived, you've succeeded a sign mm -hmm. of success, but you're saying it shouldn't really be thought of like that. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of things in this industry that are like that. It's like, I don't know. It's probably the same thing with like life in general. Like you see like big, you know, like the glitz and glamour things. It's like if a band's on a tour bus, it looks cooler. If a band gets signed, it looks cooler. If they have a man, it's cool to say we have a manager, but I mean, bands, bands, entire careers can fall apart if they have the wrong person managing it. And I've seen it happen. So that's always kind of a scary situation for a lot of bands is if they sign a contract with the wrong person or the wrong label, like it could put their careers on hold. Like, I don't want to name names, but there's a band right now that um, they just recently got out of their first label contract that they were ever in. And I love this band, but this label did nothing for them. Nothing at all. For three years, they didn't get bigger. They didn't, th nothing was happening. And now that they're out of that contract, they're able to, they're getting offers from other labels that are more notable and stuff like that. So it's the same thing with management. I, a good manager can help your career a ton, even though you got to be willing to pay. I just think that a lot of these bands jump into management and label contracts because it's like, uh, I say this because we fell for this as a band. Like we thought by getting a manager or something like that, that it, like, that makes us bigger. Like that's the thing you do. That's the sign of success, but it's really not. And I think more bands need to realize that. Like, it's cool to say you have those things, but those things may not often be the, the best thing to do in your current situation. And one thing I just wanted to ask really quick, because, um, I manage bands and I say the same thing that you do to bands when you can't handle it yourself. That's when you should start looking for a manager. But one thing I run into isn't not, isn't necessarily they can't handle it themselves. It's that they don't want to handle it themselves. So can you go into a little bit of the details of the difference between I can't handle this versus I don't want to handle this and where the detriment lies when you fall into the, I don't want to category. I mean, that is a big thing. You're absolutely right. I mean, there are bands out there that like, they don't want to do anything to the, they want to go on stage and play. That's what they live for. They don't want to have to take care of the business end of thing. And they want other people to do it. And I, there's nothing wrong with that. If, if, if a band has the finances for it and they want to hire somebody to do it, that's great. But I think the same thing applies where you have to make damn sure you're finding the right person for your band rather than just wanting to get a manager because you don't want to do it. You know what I mean? I mean, the, the reality is that all of these bands that start as local bands and, and try and get bigger in their scene, there is a sense of like cutting your teeth, like grinding, like earning your stripes. Like, I know that's such a weird thing to say, but it's like, I always joke that I say like before a band does a tour in a bus, every band should be required to do a year in a van and trailer just to humble them and like earn their like road cred, stuff like that. So, and then if you do those things before you get a manager, you kind of already know how it works anyways. So, you know, that helps, but you're absolutely correct. There are people out there that don't want to do it. And there are also people out there that don't have the skills to do it, mainly because some people don't want to learn the business. They literally just want to play they don't want to learn anything more than that. And that's when that I don't want to do it. So we're going to hire a manager situation comes in a lot. And for prospective managers out there, maybe since most managers are paid on a percentage, say you find one of the say one of those bands that doesn't want to do it reaches out to you, but they have, you know, 13 streamers on Spotify. They're they're not really known anywhere. How would you handle that situation if you were approached by somebody like that? I mean, there was there was a, a recent point in time where I was uh, thinking about getting into management. 
And mm-hmm. I have a lot of manager friends in the industry. And when managers take on young bands, it's it's kind of a gamble. And you probably know that. Like, mm-hmm. you have to see the potential in somebody and understand that while you're working with a young band, you may not make money from them for a couple of years. Like, I have a friend who manages uh, quite a few bands, a couple big, a couple small. And he's like, yeah, some of these bands, like, I didn't even make my percentage from them for the first three years of working for them because there's that growth period and stuff like that. But I think this industry sometimes lacks honesty. Um, I, I think money does get in the way and there are like managers sometimes that they'll take on a band. And recently, I'm not going to lie. I, uh, the other day, like two days ago, I got an email from like an unsigned band and they're like, Hey, you know, we watch your channel and we know you you have a lot of experience in the industry. We just want to get your take on this. They got a management contract from a manager and they they sent it to me and they're like, can you just look at this and tell us if this is like crazy? And it absolutely was. It was one of the wildest management contracts I've ever seen. And reading it, I was like, this is all about money. This is all about just somebody trying to get as much money out of somebody as possible. I don't even know if this person legitimately, this manager legitimately sees a future for the band or sees their potential. The way that the contract was written is just money. And I I think that's a problem. Like if it's me, this age in my life, like I don't like to waste time. So if I was managing and a band approached me, I would just be like, if I didn't see their potential, I, I, as heartbreaking as it is, I think I would just tell them. Um, Because being in the industry and being around music, we always say, like, you can watch a band on stage for five minutes, like a band you've never seen, like an unsigned band, and you can tell if they have it or not. And what I mean by that is, do they have what it takes to make it far in the music industry? Whether it's, and there's a lot of things that go into it, image, songwriting, live performance, like, there's so many factors into that, that the harsh reality is, I'd say less than 1% of all of the bands actually have what it takes to like make a full career out of music. And nobody's telling them that. Like, I actually, (laughs) I don't think my band was, was bad, but I wish somebody would have told me when I was younger, like, yeah, you guys just don't have it. Cause I would have saved a lot of time. (laughs) Cause looking back on it now, what I know now, I, I do believe that. Like I can look at my old band and be like, yeah, we were good for a local band, but we didn't have it. And nobody ever told us that people just wanted to make money off of us, even though that would mean we'd make nothing. So it's, it's unfortunate. I think that even a lot of people, their friends won't even tell them because, well, and maybe their friends don't even see it because our friends bands sound way better than they are. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I like this person, therefore I love their band. Like, I think it's hard to find people to be honest with you about that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's hard. You don't want to upset your friends. Like I get it. But like I said, like, I wish somebody would have done that to me. So I, I've always been like in my later years now, I've always been honest, like pre pandemic, I worked for a country artist for like six years and Every time he recorded a new song, he would show the entire band and crew on the road. Like we'd go in the dressing room and he'd play us. And he knew after a certain amount of time of me working for him, I would, I would tell him the truth. And like most everybody else would, he'd play us a song and everybody would be like, yeah, yeah, dude, this is going to be a number one hit. This is awesome. And he'd just turn and look at me and I'm like, it's all right. <laughs> like it's, it's a song. Like it's not, it's it's, it's not the greatest thing you've done. And I would change this, this, and this, I'm not saying I had any writing input on the song changing, but it's like, you know, I'm, I'm always honest with the bands that I work for. I mean, even, even with electric Callboy now they're working on a new album. If they show me something and I think it's not good, I'll, I'll just tell them it's not good. <laughs> you know, cause, cause let's be real. There's no band on the planet that is cranking out 10 out of 10 banger songs. Every time they write a song, never. Like it is so rare to even get an album from a band where you can listen to the whole thing from start to finish every single time nowadays. There's usually 
like half the songs on the album are are killer tracks and the rest is just kind of filler with maybe some hidden gems it's just how it goes and you can't be perfect all the time it's true it's true people do expect it though <laughs> yeah i i know and it's right now more than ever and I, I think it is like social media and how instant everything is available like fans music fans expect bigger and better things every time now and then when they don't get what they think they should get the bands hear about it there's no way to stay away from it anymore people are vicious animals online nowadays <laughs> especially at the bands that they like it's wild yeah i was just um Let's say there was a band that released an album in January of 2022. There might be people out there making videos saying this band hasn't released anything forever. Mm -hmm. Right yeah. now. And it's, and it's like and the album cycles are a thing. Mm -hmm. What what people don't understand is that there, there are literally like if a band is on a label, there are contracts uh, and time durations of when they have to release things and stuff like that. People think the bands are being lazy and aren't releasing anything. Now, if you're getting into a situation where it's like Winter Sun or X Japan, where they've had albums ready forever and haven't released them for 10 years just because they're not ready, that's different. <laughs> but, you know, it's like Lorna Shores, when did, Lorna Shores last album came out, I think towards the end of 2022. And people are already like, why aren't you guys releasing new music? And I'm like, they're still touring off of their album. Like, what do you want? It is this kind of cycle, like people just want to consume and keep consuming and they don't mm -hmm. really process what they're uh, consuming almost. Yeah. Kind well, of you, a, see the, you, you see the industry changing though. There are bands that are like, uh, uh, use Falling in Reverse as an example. They haven't released an album in years. There's just every few months, new single, new single music video. And that seems to be working for them. And there are other bands that are doing this too. And I think that feeds into the ability for, it's like such a, a perfect amount of time of no releases. And then something big comes out where, like you said, the people can consume that and then they're like full for a while. And then, you know, the next thing comes out, but yeah, people, people are impatient, I guess is the, <laughs> is really the thing there. And pop has been doing the single thing for years. I mean, ever since the nineties, the album was so, not even secondary, but tertiary to mm -hmm. everything else that was going on, whether it was the singles or the music videos, I, just thinking about the albums and what was popular when I grew up, like every, we just consume the music videos. We just consume the singles and the album. It was like, Oh, cool. I got it. <laughs> yeah. Country is the same way too. Like country. I mean, Nashville country music is just a songwriting factory anyways. Like it, like the same 10 writers are writing all of the number one singles for everybody. But what country artists will do is the same thing. They'll release like 10 singles and then they'll release an album. That's just those 10 singles. Like, so it's kind of interesting. It's like a compilation of all of the singles that they had released in the last two years. Um, but yeah, it seems to be working for, like you said, pop and, and country and sometimes hip hop and stuff. And now some of the, the rock and metal bands are doing the same thing. I mean, Again, I'll use uh, like, let's use like Sleep Token as, as a good example or Electric Callboy too. By the time they released their albums, their last albums, each of them, I think like nine out of the 10 songs from the albums were already released as singles. Mm -hmm. But people still buy the albums because they, they want all of those singles in one place. Yeah. They want that. And they I want the physical. Am. Oh, sorry. They want that. They want the physical. Uh, embodiment of the music the design everything mm -hmm. like that too yeah you don't get that kind of connection with just listening on spotify i mean that's like you can see behind me it's like i i that's just my wall of vinyls i have a stack over here that's like half as tall as me because i i kind of view like physical releases as kind of just like art and i like to directly support the bands that i like so that's that's why i keep buying physical media there is something special about that. And there's also something special for me about album release days. Um, like doing the YouTube thing, I've had so many bands and labels contact me uh, like months before albums come out. And they're like, 
hey, this this album's done. Would you like to hear it ahead of time? And I'm just like, nope. I'm like, I want to wait till release day. There's something special for me about the anticipation of release day for albums that like I don't want to hear things ahead of time ever. And I think that's a case for a lot of people who collect physical uh, media. Cause like for me, I have my big stack of vinyl and my big stack of books behind mm -hmm. me. Um, and like you said, for me, it's, it's not like necessarily that I'm buying the music just to listen to the album. I'm there because it's, it's beautifully pressed. A lot of the vinyl yeah. with all the colors and everything that's going on now and the big artwork that's on the front versus, you know, a CD, which is much smaller. And it is a beautiful piece of artwork and yeah. it's also very cool, like just talking about vinyl, it's also very cool to know that even if your speakers are off, if that needle is going around on those grooves, you can still lean in and you can hear the music because it's actually a physical yeah, it's cool. embodiment yeah. of the music. It's so different from everything else. Mm -hmm. And it's weird to know that a sound can be made physical like that. Yeah. And I'll, I'll fully admit 90% uh, of the music I listen to is still just like I, when I'm at my computer, I'm on my headphones, mm -hmm. it's Spotify because it's not often that I just like have the time to sit down and throw on a vinyl. Mm -hmm. So for me, it is more the collection of the art. Like it's not often that I actually sit and listen to the actual vinyl, but it is still a very cool thing. And it's also wild because like, yeah, I was talking to my dad about vinyls the other day and he's like, how is this a thing again? He's like, I got rid of all my vinyls in the early nineties. Cause I just thought it was obsolete. And my dad had like 2000 vinyls from like the sixties and seventies and eighties. And he's like, now it's a thing. I was like, yeah, dude, it was like Beanie Babies back in the day, man. He could have held on to those and like sold them for tons of money on eBay. Now people are selling vinyls for insane amounts on eBay. It's wild. Like and bands are making cassettes again. I think that's I know. more. I have a stack I, of those too. Yeah, I think that's more of a funny thing. Like, oh, wow, a cassette. Because Nobody has a cassette player. Nobody's nobody's listening to music on a cassette. Let's be honest. I have but a cassette player. I have two really? Walkmans. Yeah, I have two Walkmans even. No like from way. the 80s. Um, and one thing I would recommend if you do want to just sit and listen to your vinyl, but you don't have like time to turn everything. Mm. My vinyl player back there is it's a vintage one from 1978 and it's a, wow. a vinyl changer. So I can put a stack of five on there and it'll yeah. drop them down as they finish. And then I just can flip over the stack of five. Um, definitely right. If you can get your hands on one of those vintage vinyl changers, definitely recommend Dude, it. Can you imagine how wild that was probably when they came out? It's like, I remember when like five disc CD changers came out and we're like, yo, like a game changer. And if you had one in your car, oh yeah. my. <laughs> yeah, and back in the day, they couldn't fit like in the front of your car. So you had to have it in the trunk in this big contraption of like CDs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. It's I like, I'm, I'm not that old, but I'm starting to feel like it because like kid, like younger kids nowadays just don't understand. Like even my sister, who's only like eight years younger than me, I tell her like my first car, like, yeah, I had a cassette player. And when the, when the ability to have the cassette deck with the eighth inch cable on it to plug into like an iPod or something came out or a disc man, like game changer. And she's like, that just sounds so old. And I'm like, yeah, but it's uh, fun times. You know, it built character was from too. 1970. So I feel you. <laughs> What's that? Aaliyah would or you, me? You, would you say? I said my first car was from 1970, so I feel you on the obsolete uh, audio uh, yeah. technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, things change so fast. Like, even my first my first car I ever had, it was, a, it was like a 1990 Chevy S10 or something, and it just had a cassette player. And when I was able to save enough money to put like a, like a CD player in it, it was like, it's like the greatest thing ever at the time. I mean, I can't even technology has progressed so much in the last like even five years, but I was going to say like 10 to 15 that like nothing's really cool anymore. It's like, I remember though getting that the, the new technology, like the new disc man that had a bass boost and the anti skip technology, like this maddening at the time, but now it's just like something new comes out and we're like, yeah, okay. I was going to say, it, it actually kind of built, it built character in us because we had to like, we couldn't just skip songs on Spotify and listen to 10 seconds of a song here and then skip to another song. Like we listened to full albums, like yeah. all the way through. And especially with cassettes, you couldn't even skip tracks. So 
Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was probably in like young elementary school, maybe I was like, I don't know, 10. So this was like mid to late nineties. Uh, I would sit next to the radio waiting for the new hit single to come on with cassette there so I could record it and then re-listen to it whenever I wanted to. I like I had cassettes on cassettes in my house of like just singles from the radio that I would record. Same thing with VHS tapes. I had like the first four seasons of South Park on VHS because I would throw in a tape and just record it when it came on. <laughs> yeah, people did that with music videos too. Yeah, yeah. I had tons, dude, Headbangers Ball back in the day when it came on. I'd have a VHS ready and I'd be recording everything. Like, but now everything's instantly available. So it's like, and and I'm not trying to like, like dog on any of the younger generation or anything like that by any means. It all de- It's all dependent on when you grow up, but there is something fun and nostalgic looking back at that and like how we used to consume music and how we were obsessed with doing stuff the old fashioned way like that to just how it is now. And, um, you know, it's not just the people listening to music, it's the music industry itself that's had to adapt to all that too. It's kind of, it's kind of wild. Now I want to jump back a little bit to something you mentioned when you just say yes and you fake it till you make it right. You just say yes to doing things. If what did you ever struggle with imposter syndrome? How, how did you deal with learning everything? Um, you know, I, I will say I, I've been, I've always been realistic about it. If it's something I don't think I can do, I just say no. Like I don't want to put myself in that situation. But if it's something that I I legitimately feel I can learn and do well, then I've always said yes. Um, like good example of that, and I, I talked about this recently, but when I got offered the uh, the Power Wolf tour last year when they came to the States, like they knew I had guitar tech for a while, but they were like, yeah, we're looking for a US-based guitar tech. And I was like, okay, cool. And they're like, um, can you handle Kempers, like digital amplifiers, and all of the guitar players' guitars have Evertune bridges on them, which were kind of a new thing at the time. They're like, are you are you good with those? And I was just like, yeah. Truth is, I had never worked on either. I just knew I had the time to learn it before the tour. And I did. And by the time I got out there, they would have never known why, like been the wiser at all. Um, the imposter syndrome thing. Um, I, I may have had it here and there in the music industry. At times, I can't think of any specific case to really bring up. So I've always taken a lot of pride in what I do. Um, I think the imposter syndrome actually comes in more with uh, content creation than actually touring, um, doing YouTube and Twitch and stuff like that. Cause I never thought that d- doing content online would turn into what it has. Like never. I just thought this was going to be a pandemic project to just maybe make a little money and maybe kill some time. But now it's literally gotten to a point where um, yeah, I'm over 250,000 subscribers on YouTube which I still can't believe. And there, there are times where I struggle with that because people sometimes look at me like I'm bigger than I am. Like, and maybe I am, I don't know. Like I struggled with it on the electric Callboy tour because all of their fans from YouTube, like they know, they know who I was just, even just tour managing. Um, and when we'd be at shows, we, we, uh, there would be people waiting by their bus after shows to meet me. And I look at myself like just a normal, regular guy. And I was awkward in those situations. I really was. I was like, I don't know how to handle this. This this isn't something that I ever thought I'd ever have to deal with. And the Electric Cowboy guys kind of pulled me aside one day and they're like, dude, you just need to realize that, that, that this is what this is. Like, whether you wanted this or not. It's like, you are the guy that everybody sees and this is just what it is now. So just enjoy it and whatever. Um, I go to concerts in Nashville all the time. And if it's a metal show, like I I'm getting stopped like every 10 minutes by people that recognize me from YouTube. And it is, it is strange to me. Um, I'm not saying the people are strange. I'm saying the, the fact that I am getting recognized for just making content. That's what gives me the imposter syndrome. Like, I'm like, I don't deserve this credit. I don't deserve any kind of notoriety like this at all. That's been the hardest part for me 
especially going back out on tour when, when people recognize me and other bands recognize me on tour, like at festivals, that's the hardest part for me. Cause I feel like I've done nothing to earn that. Well, I mean, I think obviously you have, because you've brought a lot of transparency to an area that's been so opaque to people. There's no way to learn about touring costs, all the logistics, the positions that are required until you're in it. There's no way to learn about it ahead of time until people start being transparent about it online, which is what you did. I think so many people are, I know personally, many people who watch your channel and learn so much from your channel. And it was, you would say it was a, an underserved market. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I agree with that. And Funny, I had I had somebody from a band the other day uh, compare me to a whistleblower because there's this there's this, <laughs> Kinda. There's, this, there's this mentality in the music industry that like that that old saying, like what happens on the road stays on the road. There are literally people that think that I should not be bringing up some of the things I bring up on YouTube at all. And. You know, I've, I've really thought about that and I'm just like, why, though, what's so secretive about knowing how much a bus is going to cost a band on a tour? Any normal person could call a bus company right now and just say, hey, I'm looking to rent a bus for a 30 day tour. How much is this going to cost us? It's not like that's that's confidential information that nobody could find. It's just I don't think anybody ever really thought about it. Like, but I have had some some actual like band members kind of send me not great messages being like, dude, this is this is the horseshit that you're talking about this. And for me. I sleep great at night because one of the things I've always said on my channel is while I will talk about the music industry, I'm not here to air out uh, dirty laundry. Like I've never named names or put anybody in a position that would get them in trouble or anything like that. And fortunately I've never been in a lot of situations on the road where I, I have seen stuff like that that would get people in trouble. So I really have nothing to hide anyways, but yeah, it's uh, it's, it's interesting for sure. Corey, do you oh. have anything you want to wrap up with? Oh, no, I think that that is a, a good place to to wrap things. You've given people quite a bit of knowledge, quite a bit of things to think about, consider. Yeah. And we did wrap about the awesomeness that is vinyl and yeah. the cool vinyl players that people should look into. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, thank you for like, for, for I'm going to, I'm going to look into something like that too, because that's awesome. I have a guy, I'll email him to you. All right. He, uh, he like... <laughs> specific i have four turntables from him his name's alan he's great i'll send you his info it's awesome. like a drug dealer i've got a turn yeah it's like guy. i have i have i have a hookup i have a plug. i have a vinyl guy don't worry i have a turntable guy <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> awesome thank you tanks so much for coming on our podcast we've put a little bow on it everyone listening thank you for listening and until next time make like a bull and throw those horns up thank you yes thank you